and what kind of instruments you're using. Um, sorry, it seems just telling me that it's being recorded. Uh, there's, and of course you have the idea of the music and, and what you want the music to convey to the listener, what you want the music to communicate to the listener. And that's uh, a lot of where, where my research comes in is I'm really interested in, in how people uh, perceive the music that they're listening to and how they understand it and how it influences, like not just like their thoughts and their feelings, but how they think and what's going on in their lives, how they relate to it. Uh, so that's that's really where my research is is focused. So to have anyone like if I if I make you think about the kind of music you're listening to or just to think about it differently in any way, then I feel like that's a, a real bonus for me. It's, that's that's great. <laughs> so uh, as as uh, as as somebody who's very experienced and versed in that second part as you described mm -hmm. um let's let's get to your interest oh, in music in the first place how, how did you how did you get interested in music in the first place like yeah i um well i was very lucky i was uh, come from a family that's very musical my um my parents didn't play instruments themselves but they were always very enthusiastic about music and they were uh, the type of the type of parents who wanted to give us the opportunities uh, that in, in we were lucky to have um, a piano lent to us. I say lent; it's been over thirty years now. We still have that piano. It's been pretty doing a conservatory grade seven and eight. My parents were insistent that all of us uh, go and at least do that. Um, but I, from a very young age, would love to go. Before I'd even started lessons, I would like to go and play with the keys. Um, I knew by the time I was in elementary school, once we would kind of uh, talked about after elementary school, you go to high school and like college or university. And I was like, well, what's after that? And, and they got up to, you know, when you're a PhD, uh, you're the... <laughs> Now you're uh, among the people who decide uh, what needs to be taught, what needs to be researched. Uh, and at that point, I was like, I want to do a PhD in music. I don't know what the topic's going to be, but I know what's going to be in music. So I carried on. Uh, I did classical piano lessons um, all throughout until I become a teacher myself. Um, and the thing I think that just, it always gave me an, an outlet to, to let my emotions out, it relaxed me. Um, we always listened to all sorts of different genres of music in our house. There was always music playing. Um, my father had a stereo set up very specifically and would have the, like, his perfect spot in the middle of the living room where, where the acoustics were the best, where the, the setup and the speakers, everything was just perfect for him. So we all, all grew up having a real appreciation uh, for music. Uh, but for me, uh, with my with my education in music, doing my undergrad, I, I struggled a little bit because I felt like you were either going to get pigeonholed into being a teacher, especially in like a you know like a high school setting, or you'd end up you know being pushed towards uh, performance. And I had really bad performance anxiety, and I didn't want you know the thing that I love the most to be causing me anxiety for the rest of my life. And the thought of being high school in particular just seemed like a nightmare to me. Uh, so I ended up taking some time off and, and did some reading and, and, and uh, I found a book by Oliver Sacks, Musicophilia. Uh, and there was just a lot of very interesting, very new information to me about uh, just how we perceive music, uh, the influence it has on our brain. And that kind of opened up a whole new door of like music psychology for me. And that's how I ended up where I am now. I did my master's here as well in music, mind and technology. I wrote my master's thesis on uh, the, how music videos influence the perception of meaning and emotion in music. And uh, my PhD now is, is expanding on that, so the same topic. All right, this is all nicely set up. So let me, I'm gonna break it down little by little, okay? If that's okay mm -hmm. with you. Just, just passing my questions like that, okay? So you did your masters in how music affects emotions, thoughts, and well-being, correct? Mm -hmm. And now you're doing correct. your PhD in that. What was the angle? What, what was your? Uh, what, what were you positing in your master's thesis? And is it uh, different well... from what you're positing in your dissertation? Uh, slightly. Uh, when I started doing my master's, I was really interested in how people actually listen to music. There's a lot of research uh, that uses, you know, not necessarily uh, 
uh, participant chosen music. It's not, you know, we throw the word ecological validity around where we, we do a lot of experiments on how people emote to music or the feelings they get when they listen to music, but not in a setting that's natural. Um, and I had this, you know, YouTube at the time was how I was downloading and streaming most of my music. This was in 2016. And I was thinking, well, when I was growing up, I, I always liked to watch music videos, but you had to kind of hope that it would be the one that you wanted to see would be on at the time. So now that you had YouTube, all of a sudden you had all this access and control to, you know, I'm like there's so many music videos that I can remember from my past uh, that I still think about even like when I hear the song now and I thought well maybe maybe there's something there uh, so that was kind of where I was going uh, with my master's of course in 2019 uh, a report came out by the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry they do a uh, global reports every year that said that YouTube at that point was taking more than 40 percent of all online music streaming demand so that was more than audio only streaming services so I felt okay well then there's even more justification for me doing this topic now. So it's, I'm interested in the way people actually are engaging with music in their everyday life, especially because we have so much more access and control, especially with smartphones, laptops, tablets, like you can bring your music with you anywhere. Um, and all these kind of little visual, like extra musical components that are involved in our music listening experience that maybe we don't consider because there's so many, it's not just the music, it's you know, you become, you start to associate it with other things, whether it's times in your life, with people, with certain events or settings. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance there. And I, I think that that needs to be considered. So there is the difference between my master's and, and my PhD, uh, is that even though they still, like we, I use music videos very much as that's a very easy way to kind of look at these phenomena that I'm interested in. Uh, but that's not just to say that it's just music videos that I'm interested in. It's like the, the bigger picture of what causes uh, these very nuanced experiences of music that help us you know, relate to it more, uh, where we find meaning in it. And, and that's, that's really what interests me. How, of course, we can use it to you know, promote healthy well-being, especially. I know music's been there for me when I've been going through hard times. It's, it's there for, for everybody when they're going through hard times. So I have a lot of appreciation for music for that. All right, let's, let's uh, break it down a little bit. Okay, so music, food for the soul, food for the mind, and you um, have a little bit of a different analysis when it comes to musical education versus just, you know, the experience of people with music in general. What are your thoughts? on that you think musical education should be done differently why so uh i think that there's still and this isn't the case everywhere there are a lot of you know, particularly at the university level where this is starting to change but there's very much a focus on classical music mm. um and classical music is great i personally love it i you know i'm very grateful for my background in education with classical music but as a teacher as a music teacher it is very hard to get you know, small children, six, 12, 13 teenagers to be interested in classical music. And I was have a, a music history teacher from my alma mater at Queens. Uh, when I was telling her, I was teaching uh, my nephew, he's 13 years old. He's just started doing piano lessons with me. I'm like, and he doesn't want to learn classical music. He's wants to learn, you know, he kind of gave me a list of songs he'd like to learn. So I, I started with those and she's like, well, why would you want to learn something you already know? I'm like, well, why would you want to learn something you don't know? So there's still classical music has always been attached to, you know, the elite, to the aristocracy. Is the music history of it is it's always been tied as like an upper class thing. The music has been a lot more democratized now, and I don't think that the music education uh, programs, in in most cases, especially as I was saying, like in in high school, even too, uh, with the conservatories, they're still not necessarily making music as enjoyable to learn as it could be. And that's because there's still, in my opinion, in my experience, this very elitist mentality that you need to learn how to play classical music or you, you shouldn't you know, necessarily, that's what you need to start with. I think that there's plenty of merit to learning how to play classical alongside of more like popular genres, whether it's you know jazz or just pop music. 
Um, and to be totally honest, I've had far more success in getting students to learn if I do it kind of 50-50. If I, you know, we can do half a lesson, we'll, we'll learn how to play something you want to play and half the lesson we will try something that I want you to learn how to play. And 100% of the time, those students always end up excelling the most. So I think that there just needs to be a mentality shift towards not just you know, preserving this conservatory idea because it, it made sense in the 19th century before we had radios when, you know, if you wanted to listen to music, you either had to go and buy a concert ticket or it was in church. And those were kind of your only two options. That's not the case anymore. You, know, and it, you can listen to music without having to play it yourself. And I just, I think that the education needs to reflect these more popular accessible genres, especially for young people. Very nicely put. Let me ask you this. Do you play any instruments yourself? Yes. Well, my I play a uh, piano was my primary instrument. I started piano at uh, age six. When I was in middle school, um, I was able to pick up the violin. Uh, I've picked up a lot of instruments. I'd say piano and violin are still my two mains, but I know how to play guitar. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, I play played an accordion. Unfortunately, I lost my accordion a few years ago when, when my house flooded, which was a very, very sad day for me, but my siblings were maybe a little bit relieved. <laughs> um, uh, bass, pretty, any, anything that's a string instrument I can play. I was kind of forced to play viola in my last year of um, high school because I could read the alto clef and I was my uh, strings teacher in university was like, well, if you can read alto, you can play the viola. I'm like, I don't really want to, but so I kind of got stuck playing that for stuck playing it. I did enjoy it. It was nice. I was the only violist, so it was it was kind of interesting for me. But um, I'll, I'll give anything a try. But most of my experience is in string instruments and with piano. Mm -hmm. What What do you tell as a music educator? What What is it that you tell people when they first want to venture into music? Okay, because a person like me, I grew up not in a society where music per se was, you know, categorized into a course that you could take or a subject that you took at school, whether I be in, you know, junior high, primary, whatsoever. But we did have what was called choir. You could join the, you could join the choir and then you could sing. And that was it, right? And then you could learn mm -hmm. how to play the instruments because you were a member of the choir. So they'd say, does anybody know how to play the, you know, the the uh, the drums, the conga drums, then you play, or the xylophone. And so you play or the piano whatsoever. But it wasn't as formal as I found out when I came to Canada where you could actually just do music in school. You could actually just do music in university as a university course. So, uh, you know, what what is what is it as a musical teacher that you you use personally to assess the people that come into. So, so when you first get a group of people that are interested in music, how do you assess them to determine, okay, who's gonna be the interesting uh, student in this class versus, you know, who's just, Going yeah, who's just course. taking this because of, yeah, for whatever. Well, the, the nice thing about being a piano teacher, um, I, I've never taught, I don't teach in school. So all my, I, I taught at a music school, but all my courses, like the classes were all one-on-one. -on -one. We didn't have groups of students. So, I mean, there definitely were some cases where, you know, very sweet kids. It was almost kind of felt like I was babysitting for half an hour. They had no interest. They didn't get you know, you have half an hour with them a week. You don't know what they're doing at home. You can tell their parents, you know, practice this, but whether or not they actually do or not, you know, that's, I have no control over that. Uh, but the ones who are really interested are, are the ones that come like with ideas in mind of what they want to play. I had this one student who uh, she was, I ended up kind of taking her on after her teacher uh, was no longer with the school anymore. And her teacher said, you know, she's got six weeks less of, uh, six weeks left of her lessons he don't be surprised if she doesn't come back after that. She's probably not going to keep going. She doesn't practice. She's not interested. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that mentality. <laughs> I want to teach them. For me, it's important for them to learn to like it. So with this particular student, she had, you know, the teacher said she's got this Justin Bieber song that she likes. So we'll, we'll play that just, you know, that'll use your time. So I'm like, okay, we'll do half the song, half the class. We'll play this. The other half of the class, you know, we'll do some sight reading and some theory. And just because we, you know, shown some interest in what she wanted to do and we kind of grew on it, we embellished it. 
by the end of my six weeks with her, her mom was telling me that she was almost late for school a couple of times because she was playing piano in the morning. She almost missed her bus. I'm like, there is no greater compliment you can give me as a teacher as you know, then your kid was almost late for school because she was too busy practicing like that just my heart grew it was just a, the biggest compliment you could get as a teacher so there's a you know the onus is on me to kind of inspire them to to find what it is that they like the kind of genres or music that interests them and, and to be able to to put their own spin on it and we had um a, a concert at the end of our at the end of the term uh, where she played, you know, the song that she'd been learning with me for the last several weeks. And like, I had tears in my eyes. She had her own, like, you know, she did her own thing with it. She, she had her own, she put her own touch to it. And it was, it was really, you know, I, I would say that it would have been just a tragedy for this kid to give up. You know, she might not have shown that much interest in it at first, but that's just because she wasn't interested in, in what she was being given. So I think it's really the responsibility of the teacher because music is so universal, it's ubiquitous and people enjoy it is to find what it is that interests them in it. Of course, there's just some people who, you know, it's not for everybody as far as learning it is concerned, but I've had more luck with being able to teach people. Like I, I haven't had anybody who I would say is a lost cause, let's put it that way. Some people pick it up faster than others, but as long as they find something they like about it, they tend to learn pretty quickly. Nice. So I got to ask you this. Is it very tempting as a music educator or teacher to, because to almost act as a music therapist? Because I just learned this, this, this music therapy, but it seems to me that if you're teaching music, it's almost like you're, uh, you know, you're not just teaching the uh, academic side of music, but you're also teaching everything that attaches to, to, to the music. So how, how do you deal with that? Because some people might come to music thinking that they want to be uh, educated in music because that's something that they want to pursue. But it could also just be that they need music therapy for other things. So as an educator, is that something that you grapple with or is it not? Well, it's funny. I was just teaching a class um, at the university. It's a music health and well-being class. Um, and, and we actually had some, some music therapists who do like, you know, actually are practicing music therapists and music therapy researchers. Uh, who kind of were going through, you know, what it is exactly that you do. And my whole topic uh, was just how we use music in everyday life as kind of a form of therapy. Uh, so in, in that sense, you know, teaching about it, we have this very multicultural, you know, people from South America and Asia, all kind of coming together and bonding over it. And even just talking about music can make you feel good. And it was like kind of the twist to the end of the class where we've been, you know, discussing all the ways that music can promote social bonding and, and can influence your emotions. And they were, you know, as you got to see it in action as they were all doing it together. Uh, I can't speak too much about music therapy personally because I'm, I'm not a music therapist, but I, I do share an office with one. Um, and I've got to kind of experience, I've got to be her, her practice dummy and, in a couple of uh, her couple of sessions while she's kind of working out what she's doing with her research. Uh, and it's a very interesting experience. There's all sorts of different ways to kind of go about it. Um, I was doing a, like a vibroacoustic uh, session with her, which is like a, a, a chair or a mattress that vibrates at very low frequencies and you listen to music and, and you feel yourself relaxed. And it's supposed to be really helpful for like pain management. And then afterwards we go and we do some improv and it's it's a very interesting experience. It's a very interesting form of therapy, but whether it's just actual music therapy or using music to kind of, you know, reflect and like more of a cognitive therapy, it's, you know, you can, it, but that, that can also have negative consequences. So you want to teach people, you know, when you're, you can't really teach someone how to listen to music, but you can teach them to be aware of how it's affecting them. So if you're the kind of person who's listening to the same song over and over again, and you're finding it's just making you ruminate on whatever it was that was making you upset in the first place, it's probably time to put that song away. And I, like, these are the, you know, the kind of things that I get to, to talk about with people now. And I don't think it certainly doesn't get brought up in your, your average, you know, everyday high school music class, um, but they're very interesting and, and very real world relevant things to think about as far as like how we interact with music. Mm. So uh, what, what is the intersection with music 
and everything else that happens, you know. So I think it, it seems like it's very, like for me, I, I know how music makes me feel. I know when, what music does for me. Uh, and that's just my experience. But I imagine every human has a very unique experience with music. So we talk about, one of the things we talked about is the impact of music on your emotions, your thoughts, and your well-being. Are these all, does music have different influences on all of these things? Or is it just the same influence, but it's particularized? So say in your emotions, depending on what emotional state you are, the music is gonna do a certain thing. Uh, in your well-being, depending on what you're doing for wellness, the music is gonna do a certain thing. Can you talk to us a little bit? Yeah, about and it, it's it's funny that you say that because that is something that in, in my particular line of research, we have these kind of this trifecta of you've got the person, you have the music, and you have the situation where the music is being listened to. There is a lot of nuance in what can go on and a lot of changes, you know, the music you listen to when you're feeling tired or when you're feeling happy or when you're feeling down, it's not always the same experience. Uh, you can really grow to love a certain piece of music and then you can grow to hate a piece of music. So you, uh, there's a lot of like, and that's for what I was saying with my research, these kind of extra musical things that you don't really consider, but you have to take into account. Like it's, there's a, uh, all this digital technology has made it so accessible that you know now we can listen to whatever we want wherever we want 20 years ago 10 15 years ago that wasn't so easy i remember when i was a kid we used to go on bike rides and i was lucky enough to have a walkman or a discman uh and that that like limited me to one cd for the entire bike ride that's not the case anymore you can put a playlist of you know any song you want you can have it on shuffle you have access to millions of songs on all sorts of different libraries and you know spotify or apple music uh, so even just that has a huge influence on on what we're like on how we use music because and, and we don't really know all of the answers to that now because it's such a new phenomena or phenomenon. So yeah, having mobile phones that we can listen on, uh, there's so there's no singular answer to that. I mean, it really depends on what you're doing when you're listening to music because very seldom are we actually listening to music and totally focusing on the music. We usually do it kind of secondary to something else. We listen to music when we're traveling, when we're exercising and doing chores, like we kind of use it to, to fill time. Right. Very rarely are we actually listening just to music. Right. Um, and actually uh, my partner has done, uh, he had developed an app uh, like just to see how people use music to regulate their emotions when they're listening to music on their mobile phones. And he found it was like a very small percentage, like less than you would think that people are actually actively listening to music for emotion regulation reasons. And usually when they are, it's because they're in a bad mood. Music might influence their emotional state and, uh, and there, you know, there's ways to measure that, but that's not necessarily always what the reason was to begin with. So you kind of have to look at, you know, why are people listening? What's the goal? What's their intention? What are they getting out of the experience? And then depending on whatever's going on on, on those two levels, you kind of have a, a what's the follow-up effect? Is this every time they listen to music, is it the same kind of associations? If you're always listening to the same song when you're traveling, you always go to the same music when you're upset. So there's really, it, it does affect you differently, you know, depending on even the time of day. So there's, mm. there's a lot to look at. There's a lot to research. Um, there will be all sorts of research articles that will tell you, you know, different things about, you know, how, uh, you know, musicians versus non-musicians use music, how, you know, men or women and non-gender conforming people all use music and, and some different personalities, people of different ages. So there is unfortunately no no one answer to that. There, it's it's really depends on, on what's going on in the moment, but we are developing all sorts of new techniques to be able to kind of dive into that further and research it and, and get to know how, like on a grander level, what music is really doing for us, especially now that it's so accessible. Mm. Why should people listen to music? Why? Oh, there is, yeah. 
<laughs> That's a loaded question because know, how, how terrible would it be if you couldn't? Like, how, how would you even be able to get through life if you didn't listen to music? Like, it's everywhere, whether you want it to be or not. Like, you know, it's, you go to the stores, music is playing. You watch TV, music is playing. You go anything, you, you know, hear your neighbor singing in the shower downstairs. Like, it's it would be a very dull life. Like, but it's, it also gives you... I don't, I don't know why, why I can't imagine a life without music. It's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough one for me to answer, to be totally honest. I think it's a, why would you want to study music is uh, maybe a, a different way of looking at it. And I think because it's, it's very, not only is it just fulfilling, but there's a lot of, you know, even the technical side of how music is structured and, and what's going on. Like it's basically math that, you know, it's the sound and vibrations, like everything vibrates. It's, it's it's a part of the world and it's it's worth knowing for just that reason and then it gives you an idea of kind of how to express emotions with this which is something that's very important i think is is knowing how to kind of not only just regulate and maintain your emotions but being able to recognize them and, and associate them whether it's with music or, or something else i think yeah I, I don't know if they're, what the single answer is to that question, other than like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> why wouldn't you listen to me? No, no, you're, you're, you're actually on the right track. And I just threw that in there because, you know, we're talking a lot about music and all these things. And so, you know, it just jumped at me like, wh why should people, because I imagine that there are people who go through life, you know, probably not, they might have one or two, you know, a couple of musics that they listen to, but, you know, why is it important for music to be a part and parcel of life? Not necessarily yeah. just something you turn to for therapy, you turn to for entertainment, but why, it seems to me that we are, we are sort of musically wired naturally, you know? Uh, uh, so, so that's why I was pushing that. But I wanna ask you this question and you can piggyback on, on all of these things I was talking about. It seems to me that classical traditional music seems to be, you know, the, this standard out here that when it comes to music, everything else, whether it be the impact on well-being, on emotions and thoughts, it always revolves around, it, it goes back to classical music. And there has not been a lot of focus on other kinds of traditional, other kinds of diverse musics that might achieve the same goal. Is that something that you? Uh, yeah, and in actually, even in, in our, yeah, and in, in our field, like the a lot of previous research was very, you know, have people sit in the lab and listen to some classical music that they weren't necessarily familiar with, and they're like, that's not how people listen to music. This isn't very necessarily accurate as far as how people really listen to music. In everyday life i think that it's it's just a mentality that's gotten to be very hard to break like conservatories and, and music education is still really in its infancy in a lot of ways like conservatories became very popular in the 19th century by the 20th century you started to have radios and you had more you know popular music genres uh which were you know kind of frowned upon in, in, in classical music as being you know less just yeah not as good as and not as elite as classical music because that is exactly it's it's the gold standard as far as as learning music is concerned but it's not even just these new genres it's also you know folk genres more traditional like nationalistic genres or cultural genres that absolutely like need and merit you know like being at being added into music education programs but also looked at as far as research is concerned there is of course a lot of you know we call it ethnomusicology research and looking at music in different cultures and such um but i i i think that it is starting to happen where people are moving beyond just having classical music in, in the uh, in the classroom in the universities in finland in the nordic countries uh, there is a lot more emphasis on more popular genres than there are say in most like Canadian universities. Uh, but I mean, classical music is great. There's a large repertoire to choose from. Um, as far as research goes, a lot of the time, especially with younger people, they're not necessarily familiar with it. So that can be, you know, depending on what you're researching, that can help if you don't want somebody to already have a very emotional attachment or a lot of associations with a certain piece of music. It can be good to test that out with something, especially that doesn't have any lyrics. Uh, it could be useful for that. Um, I. 
I certainly think it's just like any genre, it's always worth giving a chance, but it's not always for everybody. So it's, yeah, it's making it accessible. It's not always very good to start with classical music, but it's just a mentality that we've gotten into at this point. It's hard to shake. And you, you have a, a very unique idea about how you think music education should go rather than the way it's being taught. And that is part in part to your own experience in music. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, my experience with teaching, with teaching music, you mean, sorry? Well, or just I, how it's- I, I'm, I'm bringing me. two things together. So your experience in music, but you also think that music education should be done differently than the way it's currently being done. So I, I kind of want you to link your experience in music to why you think the pedagogy of music, edu you know, of music should be done differently. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, I was very lucky that I, I picked up on classical music and that I enjoyed it and that I excelled when I when I was learning it. I was, you know, by no means the best pianist ever, but I, I picked it up fairly quickly. And, you know, that was all through classical music. Uh, with my experience, though, like I, I enjoyed all sorts of different genres. I played in bands when I was in high school. I, you know, like I, I still write music now. I, I wouldn't say that it's very classical necessarily, but like, you know, there's certainly some that influence and such there. Uh, it's, I just, it needs to, like anything, you know, when you, when you have when you, a large scientific breakthrough, you don't keep teaching what you knew before the breakthrough, you move on and you incorporate the new information into your lesson because otherwise, what are you teaching? Uh, so, I mean, in my experience, I was very lucky that I enjoyed playing classical music, but that's not the case for younger people. And it's, it's going to be a, a sink or swim, I think, for a lot of music schools. It's not, you know, you don't want to have kids come in and then just like, you know, hate the time that they spend there because that's not what music is supposed to be about. So, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that with my experience, I, I knew that I wanted to do something with music and I, I had you know, the toolbox of being able to, to play classical music that if I really wanted a career there, I'd have to work hard, but it, it wasn't what I wanted. And I'm lucky that I kind of was able to bridge the gap and, and use those skills elsewhere. And I think that's also something that we're not really taught as, as musicians. It's like, you kind of, you have to go out there and it's a lot of work all, for very little pay a lot of the time. Like it's just, it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of repeating the same stuff over and over again. It's, you know, instruments aren't very ergonomic. Like, you know, you play violin and you're standing like this for forever. It's not comfortable playing the piano for a very long time, especially if you're out of practice is uncomfortable. You can, you know, get strained. Uh, so it's just, there's a lot more to music than just classical. And that needs to be, this appreciation for music needs to be added as well, that to be able to listen to any kind of genre of music and pick it apart on a structural level and also on like a semantic level of what was the composer trying to get across? What are you as a listener, you know, absorbing from it? It, it teaches empathy. There's a lot of other skills that you can develop when you kind of look at this education differently, as opposed to just trying to, to drill a classical agenda into a 12 year old who couldn't care less. So it's, I, I think that we need to start kind of catering to our audience instead of just sticking to, to what we know. And, and just because it's, you know, the elitist genre of you know, classical music, it's difficult. And I think that's also something, it's something to strive to, to want to learn how to do. I know that there are still a lot of classical pieces that I have always wanted to play that are, you know, difficult pieces pieces that now I have time to learn and can really focus on. Um, but it's my classical training has not necessarily been the thing that has moved me forward. It's been the way I think about music that's that's helped me move forward in my career. So I think it's just this attitude kind of needs to change in, in that respect at, at all levels from the elementary, middle, high school level to universities as well. Mm. <clears throat> And there are some of my old professors who probably, if they see this, are like, oh my gosh, how could she? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, you know, and, and the funny thing is that, you know, those same professors would always say that, you know, we, 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 we raise this, uh, you know, we, we teach our students and we expect that our students are going to be better than us, right? But then they, you know, I, I remember that my teachers always said, the student always gets better than the teacher at some point, but it's always fun. That's how that it should be. <laughs> they, they resist that for the longest time that they can, right? So it's like, 
You know, that's very funny because um, I have a, my, my same music therapy office mate, her and I were talking about this recently. We both did a Royal Conservatory exams in piano. And I, I did all of them up to the uh, the very last one, your associates, uh, your ARCTs, you're an associate to the Royal Conservatory of Toronto. Um, and I'm doing my PhD now. So I can like pretty much say that as far as like, it's, it's a performance thing where you basically play like an hour's worth of very difficult, you know, pieces by memory. Um, and it's an expensive exam to write. A lot of the time they'll just try to fail you to get you to write it again because people aren't really passing it or people don't do it. Uh, or, you know, you just kind of just barely pass because it's, the, you know, you're at their level now and they, it's, it's kind of the last time that they can really criticize you for what you're doing. And it wasn't until very recently that I was like, I'm not going to do my associates. I don't really care. I would rather just play pieces that I enjoy playing as opposed to, you know, there are certain genres like a, you have to play a, a play a Bach prelude and fugue. I never enjoyed playing Bach. I am not going to dedicate hours of my life learning how to play a piece that gives, you know, no reward to me or very little at the end of the day. Uh, so I use that as an example. There, there are some exceptions, but, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> but, it, and it's funny because Rear and I were talking about like that mentality is still drilled in me after 20 something years of playing the piano. I'm still like preparing for an exam. I actually Actually know at the end of the day I'm probably never going to do and I'm, it was a very like freeing being like I'm actually just going to focus on the stuff I want to learn how to play because I haven't played piano as much doing research and it's because in my mind I'm like if you're going to practice you have to practice these pieces and then I avoid it mm -hmm. and I don't I don't want to teach myself to avoid doing something that's always brought me so much joy so I decided that a PhD was enough. Mm. <laughs> what is the intersection between music and all of this activism that happens. Uh, is that something that you consider in your research or is that something Absolutely. that inadvertently fe features in your research? Because it seems to me that there is, uh, you, you know, just like everything, sports, music, they all at some point cross paths with this activist world. And so mm -hmm. then, the artist has to pick and choose how they want to cater their artistic career in alignment with these, uh, you know, world values and whether they are activists to it or whether they are pro status quo. Is that some like how do you deal with that? It, it has, I think, especially in because I'm really interested in like in the music psychology world. I'm really interested in, of course, this like audio visual component. Um, one thing that's come up a lot in my research and as you're saying, it's kind of inadvertently that I've had to look at it is uh, this idea of values and you know you can like a song, uh, but then when you see what the artist is really meant what their meaning is behind it, especially when you know you have something visual that you can really absorb and engage with when you're listening. Uh, one thing that really influences how much people like a certain song can be is the artist's values in line with mine. Like, is there a pro-social message here? Are they, is there a misogynistic message here? Is there a violent message here? Is there a, a like a, um, if you're saying status quo, like what's their kind of political leaning? What are they using their platform to spread good or to spread bad? And that's, that's something that has come through in my research that wasn't necessarily something that I was looking for, but it's definitely an influence on how people uh, perceive and enjoy music. Uh, and that's, that's something, especially in the music psychology side of things, that's, that's very important to us. So, uh, you know, back in the day, we didn't necessarily want to, or we didn't affiliate composers in particular with, with a certain political movements, for example. And I remember, oh, there, this is, you know, years ago now that when the Dixie Chicks said something about, you know, President Bush being from Texas and how they, you know, didn't care for him and the whole shut up and sing thing started. And now we really want our, our favorite musicians uh, to have a political voice. Is there, is that necessarily their place? Do I really want my musicians to be, you know, a political voice? I, that's a tricky question to answer because I, I think, Think that you know on the one hand that music should be music and politics should be politics but music and, and society have always been intertwined that's exactly how we ended up getting classical music and such in the first place how we ended up getting conservatories how we ended up getting this you know elite I, ideas behind that kind of music was because of the society that it was generated from but as music has become more democratized we do see this shift we're in a, a globalized world where we can make these kinds of connections and associations with, you know, uh, music and 
values and politics. And well, sometimes that can be very exhausting. It, you don't want every single thing that you listen to to be super meaningful in that respect. Uh, but it, it's, yeah, it's, it's all tied together now. And it's, it's very much part of people's listening experience, especially when it comes down to preferences and, and artists and uh, we, have, we call them parasocial relationships, these kind of imagined relationships that you have with media characters who don't necessarily, you know, obviously they don't know you, but you start to create your own friendship with them. It's a one-sided friendship, but for the person, for the listener, it's a very real one. Uh, so in, in my research, you know, it's come up kind of as a as a byproduct of, of what I've chosen to look at for, for my dissertation. So it is very interesting. And, and you get to, yeah, it's it's something that's here to stay. That's for sure. So I have to ask you this. Uh, how poetic are you? How poetic or sorry? Po yeah, 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 that's right. How poetic are you? Oh gosh, I don't know. I suppose that's uh, <laughs> no. The reason um, I I'm sorry. The reason I ask is because I was just sitting here as you were talking. I'm thinking about okay. Um, I'm thinking of Twelve Night. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book, uh, the the drama Twelve Night, but uh, it's it's a, it's an English drama, and it, it opens with a scene where this person says, "If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it." That's a feeling, so that the appetite may sweeten and so die. So, you know, it, it's that blend of me of you know music and poetry, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, and when somebody tells me that they're doing a dissertation in music, you know, it, it's hard. I, I mean, from talking to you, I know what you're doing, but for others, it's hard to determine, okay, is it are they going to be focused on the writing part or are they going to be focused on the performance part or the yeah those seems to be the two things that people get pigeonholed into right yeah right so that's why i was asking how poetic are you just to see you know. well it depends on what you define as poetic i tend to make up a lot of songs around my apartment about you know mundane objects and <laughs> my, my boyfriend will sometimes just kind of sigh and laugh like looking for rhymes everywhere so i guess you could say i'm a little bit of a, of a poet in that sense but I think, you know, music is, it's very profound and I, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be the most profound person in the world, but you, yeah, looking at these things, it uh, certainly makes you see, see stuff differently. And of course, you know, speaking of poetry, it's all got a rhyme and a structure to it. So it's not far off from music. Um, whether or not my rhymes are always the best is, is subjective, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so fundamentally, um, is, would you recommend that every human should dabble in some some form or some part of music? Yeah, would that especially be something singing. That you advocate for? Yeah, absolutely. I think music should uh, be part of every education program, especially you know from from primary school onward to to high school. Of course, after that, it's like you know you should take it or leave it if you want. It's, it's not for everybody. It's people vary in, in how much they're engaged with music and how much it interests them. I know a lot of people who are, you know, would consider themselves huge musicologists, yeah, musicaholics, but uh, aren't necessarily, you know, proficient in any kind of instrument. But it's, it's the worst. I think everybody should have at least a basic education in it. It's just like any other, any other topic. Uh, and as far as like, you know, I did a lot of music theory in my undergrad. It's very interesting. Like there's a lot to do with with numbers and, you know, relationships between numbers that, you know, you don't necessarily think of when you think of music right away, but music is just, it's patterns and sounds and space. And it's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely, I think it gives you a different perspective of things, especially if you're looking at kind of music, that's not just the music that you're familiar with and you grew up with, it gives you a different outlook on, on life. Mm, mm. And we use a lot of music to tell a lot of stories some very difficult mm -hmm. stories that cannot be told in other formats except for in a music format because that's the only way that it could be palatable to people because if people can listen to it in that musical format then they can take the message otherwise if you were just telling them in like a symposium or something they might not be able to so uh my question then is why should all of us try to use music as a point of advocacy? Oh, uh, 
That's, I, I think that it can, I, I don't know how, how to best put this. I know. I. It's uh, a tough question. You're asking, I know, you're asking I all the hard hitting questions. <laughs> Well, I, I, it helps I, if I, I mean to, you know, it's part in the puns, but it does. It helps you find your voice. It's, it's truly. And so, uh, so you're saying like, uh, if, 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 if music helps you find your voice, it doesn't matter if you're a perfectionist in, in the genre per se, yeah. but, 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 you know, if, if, if it gives you that confidence to, to speak out against a societal ill, then use that voice in, in, in that yeah, forum. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, if, if, if it, it can be a, a huge, a, a huge outlet for people, a very important outlet for people, whether it's they're creating it or, or listening to it. Also, people can ascribe their own music, like meanings to music that weren't necessarily the ones that were intended by the composer. And even that can be very powerful. I mean, I know with a lot of my research, I, I kind of look at what happens when, you know, the meaning that you, put onto a certain piece of music doesn't end up being the meaning that the composer intended. And sometimes that can have, you know, positive or negative effects depending on what the composer did or whatever the artist did want the music to have come across. Um, but it's, it's, if it's a tool for you to kind of put something in, into words or into sound or to express yourself with, in, in a safe place where you don't necessarily have to share it with anybody if you don't want to, then it, it can be incredibly therapeutic. And we, we live in a, in a time full of stress and being able to manage it in any way possible is super helpful. Of course, you know, when it comes to, if, for the lay person, for someone who's not a professional musician, that, that can be quite hard because music is an expensive hobby. And especially if you want to play with other people, it's like you require instruments, you require all this equipment, you need space. A lot of the time that kind of playing is done in public. So you need to have a public forum where you could do it as well. So it can be difficult, um, but whether it's, it's, you know, creating your own music and, and whether it's just writing lyrics and figuring out a tune, like most people can do that. You don't necessarily need to have a background in music theory or composition to be able to come up with your own tunes. Uh, but if it's something that, you know, helps you also find other people who kind of identify with the same values as you do, then it's super rewarding and it's a great platform for that mm -hmm. so we've just gone through a period of a pandemic uh and i'm gonna uh to all of our viewers i know it's it's uh five minutes above the hour and i have a few questions for our guest and i know it's also late for her so i don't want to keep her too late we have a lot of questions actually so we might have to bring her back when she's done that dissertation but um I wanted to ask you this. So music, uh, how, how, have, how has music helped you deal with this pandemic? You know, I actually just had a paper published on this. Oh, we should share your paper then. <laughs> uh, yes, I will share it. It's a paper of, I wrote with a, a bunch of um, my peers and my supervisors in my department. Uh, it's but my uh, friend, my postdoc friend, Emily Carlson and I are, are first authors on this. Uh, it's in Frontiers in Psychology, so it's open access. Uh, I'll send you the link to it, but we actually, we looked at how people were using music in everyday life during the pandemic to cope with, you know, the stress and anxiety of being, uh, you know, in a pandemic. So, I mean, for me, it was, that was one of the things that helped me cope with with music during the pandemic was I was like there there is this really interesting subject that we should look at so from like a scientist perspective I'm like this is really interesting but also awful that we're like you know it's an opportunity for us to go and to look and see what's happening and that's exciting but then you also have this you know as a human being you're like I wish it wasn't I mean for me personally uh, nothing in my daily life really changed as far as like, you know, my, I'm very lucky. I could kind of always do my work from home. Uh, in Finland, the situation was never as bad as it was in like in Ontario where I'm from in particular or in certain parts of Canada. Uh, but, you know, I had kind of more time to go back and kind of explore some of the music I listened to during my childhood, or there was a lot of, um, live streamed concerts in, uh, in another article that we, um, uh, that I did recently to do with COVID, we created a database of kind of all of this YouTube, uh, like, well, in particular YouTube, but like new COVID um, pandemic songs, like COVID dances, like all this kind of a uh, new content that was generated from the pandemic, uh, you know, songs about washing your hands and even like the more political songs and stuff that, that came up during it. So it was 
for me, what was, I found very interesting was just like seeing people use music to cope, you know, and as I was saying, from listening to it or creating their own, that for me was just very profound. And even, you know, in situations where, because a lot of our music listening happens during commuting for people who weren't commuting anymore, they were substituting it with something else a lot of the time, not for everybody. Um, but then there were also people who, when they were listening to music, had to stop listening to certain genres or had to stop listening to certain songs that they always really enjoyed before because it was giving them anxiety. And we found a, a relationship between that and actually like a base anxiety scores in people where we're like if one of the conclusions from our paper was if you're listening to music and it's constantly making you feel bad, it might be time to start looking into getting some professional help. If you're this, you know, if this is triggering anxiety for you, if it's just, you know, small thing that's doing that. Um, so for me personally, it was a, a research venture. And I also got to kind of, you know, explore some old, like my old pieces that I used to play is some old songs that I used to listen to that I hadn't thought about in a while. Uh, but it's, I guess maybe I'm a little bit biased and it's hard for me to, to even really give a, not a, a, say an honest answer, but because it's always sort of in the back of my mind and I'm always so interested in how people are using music. So in a way that's the part that it, that affected me was seeing how, seeing people adapt to their situation and how music was such a part of that. Mm. It's very, very, very powerful. Uh, so a uh, couple final questions. Do you find uh, being a native of Ontario, that musical traditions differ when you go cross continent because you're in Finland. Uh, uh, oh, I, so so, uh, what's your experience with with, with uh, Finnish music as compared to Canadian music? <laughs> um, well, you know, Finnish is a very interesting language. Uh, I, I don't speak it very well. It's a very very hard language to learn. But it's a very uh, like the rhyme and the way that the, the words are structured, the way it's is so different from English that it's actually a very interesting language to listen to music. And of course, even in the Finnish like music departments are good structured very differently from my experience and being in the music university in, in Canada. There's a lot more uh, kind of freedom over what it is that you can really look at. Uh, we have a lot more of a technology kind of component to it. We have a, like, and there was a technology component to it at Queens as well, but not to the same extent as it is here. Uh, one of the things uh, we I had for my master's, we did a project where we designed a pair of socks that if I did a certain dance move wearing these socks, it would play a certain part of the song. So that the point of it being like, yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. Unfortunately, when we went to go and do the actual presentation, I don't know what happened, but like we had it working in our motion capture lab where we had done all the, um, the design and stuff for it. But when we went to go and do it on stage, it didn't work out very well. So I just ended up dancing like a, like a silly person without getting the effect that I wanted, but it was still, it worked out all right in the end. Uh, so there is a, a huge difference in kind of what the focus is on um, between the two universities. The music itself, uh, Finn's still listen to a lot of the same kind of genres as we do back home. Uh, a lot of the same music, you know, that is popular there is popular here. Uh, the live music scene here is incredible. I have not gone to a live concert where the like musicianship isn't just like top caliber. And I mean, like even in the rock bands, like heavy metal is a big genre here. Actually, one of my bosses, uh, one of our heads of department is in a, a rock band that plays in the, the local local bars here and she's a, a trained soprano and you know she sings in this rock band and it's so cool to watch and it's so cool to know that like these are the people who I work with or you know they're on their day-to-day -day lives are super cool as well so it's a completely different atmosphere I think here it's a lot more open and of course it's not just classical music that people focus on here compared to at home but as far as general like listening habits and stuff are concerned they're not, not they're not that different. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think you're going to be uh, a music educator at the end of your, uh, of your studies or what, what do you think? I want to stay in research, but I would like to, you know, teaching has, always, I've always liked teaching. I don't know that I would want to be a piano teacher forever. If I did, it would be something like, you know, just, just a few students on the side because I, I do enjoy doing that. I think it's, it's very, especially when the student gets something out of it, I get a lot out of it. Um, but I do really enjoy my research. And for me, actually, the goal has always kind of been professorship. I would like 
to be somebody who's doing research and then also teaching about the stuff that's doing. I want to continue the conversation. I want the conversation to keep going when I go. I, I don't, you know, I, like you're saying, the next generation, I, it's, I want them to know more than me. I want them to carry on, take the stuff that, you know, I can hopefully give them and then and bring it on to the next generation too. It's just this, this snowball of knowledge. I think it needs to keep going. So I, I do, uh, I hope to keep teaching. I, I taught a summer school class last week. I got so much out of that. And the uh, the students seem to as well, this uh, music health and well-being class that we did in the international summer school. Uh, and when when people, when my students, when they have find value in the course, that, that is everything to me. There is no more rewarding feeling for me than, than to have the information that, you know, is part of my everyday, you know, day-to-day -day job, what I am reading and writing about every day for other people who don't necessarily think about music that way to find it fulfilling to hear about is just the most rewarding feeling. So hopefully I get to, to keep teaching or that I get to, you know, like I said, professorship or you know, being able to lecture has always been, I've always wanted to teach at kind of the university level where I could do research as well. So hopefully that ends up being the case for me. Mm -hmm. Final question uh, before we go. What is the uh, impact of the, it seems that right now we live in a world that's very um, attuned to activism. So are you seeing any impact of all of the movements that are sort of coalescing around the world right now, whether it be, you know, uh, I'll just take note. So, you know, this is Pride Month, you know, it's also Asian Heritage Month. We've just come from African Heritage Month with the whole things with uh, Josh Floyd uh, anniversary. You know, we have uh, here in Canada, we also have like, you know, uh, some things that we're dealing with with respect to are indigenous yeah. peoples. So yeah. do you find in your scholarship that all of these different things are having an impact in the scholarship of music? Well, definitely. And if it, if it, it, I think it will continue to be so. And a lot of that comes back to what I was saying with the, the platforms that we have to listen to music on now with everything being so globalized like you have more access to what's going on, on the other side of the world now than you did you know before and in, in, in past decades uh, and music has kind of always been connected to you know the, what is going on in society at the time you get protest music and you get uh, you know the stuff that we're seeing now and and it's it gives a platform for artists to you know whether it's it's their commentary on it or their own experience that they're talking about it's like with social media, especially, there's there's a way to, to share all these things and to spreading a message through music is a very easy way to kind of get people onto a topic. And it it does teach like kind of a, a global empathy of, of being to try to relate to each other and to understand each other better. And having access to this kind of information, even if it is just in the form of music, it makes it accessible and it makes it easy to relate to. And it's, it's enjoyable uh, for, for the listener. It's something that, you know, they can, enjoy and listen and, and like but then also you know know what the message was and I think especially you know like when I was saying when I do my research on music videos it becomes a huge platform for that um, in my research people often bring up you know not just the social trends fashion trends viral videos memes but you know there's a an underlying message to the song that I didn't know existed before I didn't know this was a song about gay rights I didn't know this was a song about the Me Too movement I didn't know this was about this but it's so much more fulfilling to me now. And it's making me think about things differently now that I can, I have something to associate this with. And then the song becomes associated with the message. So now that we kind of live in this world where it is easier to, to know more about your neighbor, to know more about, you know, different cultures and backgrounds and people that, you know, it's not necessarily what you were brought up with. It's gonna, I, I think, teach us all to be a little bit more empathetic and respectful and understanding towards each other because we get to, a more of an insight into what different people are going through. And, and music is a great way to communicate that. Mm. <clears throat> Joanna, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. For sharing with us. And honestly, I want you to come back um, at some point, whether it's at the conclusion of your uh, doctoral program or some point, we want to have you back because there's just a lot we could talk about on the influence of music. And there's so many things that intersect with that that we would like to explore and certainly get your perspective as somebody who's researching in this field um, on you know, all the things. 
And, you know, I'm sorry that we kind of started in a rocky fashion today, but, you know, hopefully next time we'll be able to also bring in our viewers to ask questions. As I imagine, uh, there are a lot of people who have questions uh, on various things around this. But thank you so much uh, for taking- Thank you so much for having me. It's been yes. a pleasure. Yes, we'll be in touch. I'm always happy to come back. Okay. And have a great night. And uh, I thank know you. You wouldn't you. know it's night here. It's eleven fifteen, and the sun is still up. So, is it? You know what? You know uh, when I studied geography, they used to tell us that you know the land of the midnight sun was Norway, mm -hmm. Sweden, and Finland, right? But I've never yes. had you know events of that so it's funny that you mentioned that it's still light out because yeah it's it's the sun technically goes down at 11 but it never actually totally goes down so if it's like from 11 till about 3 30 right now is you know sundown to sunrise but it's never far enough below the horizon for it to actually get totally dark so as i said it's no problem being up late the sun usually keeps me up late anyway <laughs> well we are very grateful to have you sharing all of this knowledge with us and staying up late for that purpose. So thank you so much. And uh, we you. will uh, do well to have you back on the show. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chefs. You have a wonderful day. You mm -hmm. as well. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that was Joanna Wilson, uh, a doctoral researcher. And we are going to be having a great show next week and tune in, please, uh, for that show. And during the week, you would see our flyer uh, telling you a little bit more about uh, our guest for the next week. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, for all of our viewers in Canada, it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon. So have a great evening. And for all of our viewers joining us from any other place around the world, we wish you a good night for those in Asia uh, and in Africa and a good evening for those in North America. And so thank you and be blessed, stay safe. I'm your host here, Chaps McFarlane. Welcome to Unfiltered. I'm your host here, Chaps McFarlane. Welcome to Unfiltered. I'm your host here, Chaps McFarlane. Welcome to Unfiltered.